And I'd like to introduce um, our speaker. Um, today, we're gonna to be hearing from Ivana Henry, um, and she's our management program analyst for the Outreach and Stakeholder Engagement Division of the Integrated and Ward Environment. And uh, with that, Ivana, I will turn the microphone over to you. Thank you, Alexis. So uh, welcome to our SAMDACOV training for tribal governments and Native American-owned businesses. Um, I'm really happy to have you here with us today. Um, as, as Alexis said, my name is Ivana, and over the past nine months or so, I've worked with many different businesses and government entities who were having trouble either getting a new UEI or renewing their existing registration in SAM. Um, so this has given us a pretty good idea of the questions and challenges that probably brought you here to this training today. Um, so we've designed the slides and, and my presentation around those. Um, so please try to limit distractions and lend me your attention for the next hour or so um, as we go through the slides. And if your specific question isn't covered, um, you'll be able to type it in the Q&A box. Um, I think we'll have a couple, Alexis and uh, maybe uh, our director joining us. Um, who may be able to answer some questions as we go. Um, but if not, we're going to be, I'll be trying to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Uh, next slide. Okay, so by the end of the presentation, um, you should know how to get started the right way, which is a little bit different if you're updating an existing registration or if you're coming into SAM to start a brand new registration. Um, you're going to learn about entity validation, and we'll also uh, address validation challenges with rural addresses, um, as we know that's been, you know, a challenge uh, for many tribal entities. Um, we'll also share important things to know when completing the registration pages, um, entering, you know, some key information accurately in the core data section and the reps and certs, um, with, which will help ensure that you get full and fair access to the federal market. Um, and we're here to um, and we're here to help you. So we'll also show you where to get help if after today you still get stuck on any of the steps. Uh, so first, I'm going to talk about updating an existing registration. Um, for those of you who are already registered in SAM um, prior to April 2022, you may recall having a DUNS number. For many years, the validation service in SAM.gov was provided by Dunn and Bradstreet in their system, which resulted in the assignment of a Dunn's number, which you would then come to SAM.gov and plug in and continue registering. As of April 4th, 2022, we changed providers and the validation uh, process became integrated in SAM. So if you existed in SAM.gov with a DUNS number, you automatically at that time got a um, unique entity identifier, also referred to as a UEI. Um, this was assigned to you automatically to replace your DUNS number. Because of this validation process change, even though you may have already been assigned a UEI, you still need to go through a validation process the first time you come in to renew an update. Um, the good news is that everyone will only need to do this once until there's a change made to either your legal business name or your physical address. And I'm going to go into more detail, a lot more detail on the validation process a little bit later in the slides. Um, so this slide here is laying out the entire process with all the steps and verification um, that anyone with an existing registration will go through and we'll go over them, like I said, in more detail today. Um, but I'm first going to focus on those first three steps highlighted in green, uh, which are very important because how you get started really does matter. If you do not start right, you could end up on the wrong path and failing at one of the other um, steps and verifications um, later on. Um, and, and that can add a lot of unnecessary time and frustration. So we want to start there. Um, so let's uh, look at the screens that you're going to see on each of these steps. Okay, so first I'll note that on the upper left-hand corner, we have the step number in the blue circle on each slide. So as I go through the screens, you can, you can refer back to that process shown and, and you'll know what step we're talking about and where we're at in the overall process. Um, so step one here, the first thing that you're gonna need to do, which goes for everyone, no matter your situation, is you're going to have to sign in um, 
go to SAM.gov and sign in by clicking the sign in link at the top right of the SAM.gov homepage. If you already have a login.gov account, which you may for and may use for a variety of other government systems, you can sign in with that same email address and password. Um, if you're new to managing this existing registration, you might need to first create an account by selecting the create account button. But in most cases, if you already have a registration, you would have been assigned a role, you would have needed a SAM.gov account to even get um, here. Um, okay, so next slide. Once you're signed in successfully, you're gonna land here on your workspace. And um, this is where you'll be able um, to complete step two, which is um, renew or you know, update your entities. So you will, you're will you gonna know first of all that you're signed in successfully because you'll see the link on the upper right hand side um, change from sign in to sign out. Um, and you're also gonna have um, other links up there that'll stay there um, as you move through. So for example, the workspace link is a key one. So if you navigate away from your workspace at any point, you wanna return back here, you just click on that workspace link. Um, we've highlighted here the entities box uh, towards the left. This is where you should be able to find um, the list of entities you belong to um, or that you have a role assigned for. Many of you um, may only belong to or have a role to one business or government entity. So in that case, you're only going to see a number one um, in one of the circles or the bubbles um, shown in this box. Um, but in this example, the user has a role with more than one. Um, so more than one entity. So going left to right, um, we're seeing that this user has four active registrations. They have two ID assigned records and ID assigned means that the UEI was assigned, but they are not registered yet. And maybe they don't need to register those entities. Maybe they just needed the UEI. They also have five inactive registration. So once an expiration date passes for an active registration, it becomes inactive and moves out of that active bubble into the inactive bubble. Um, then we have three pending ID assignment records. Um, these reflect uh, re new requests uh, for new entities that have not, been, not yet been assigned a UEI. So they're somewhere in the process of validation. And then we have, they have seven work in progress registrations. Um, so if you have a work in progress registration, it implies that you passed or completed the validation steps, but the user is still working on completing the rest of the registration information and has not yet submitted their registration. Um, currently, there's zero submitted registrations, but if they were to complete uh, all of the pages in the work in progress registration and hit the submit button, that registration or entity record would move into that submitted bucket. Um, so once all of the 15 steps that were shown in that earlier map were completed, including um, some of the outside verifications that we'll talk about, um, those registrations will become active and they will move into the active registration bucket. Um, so all of these um, circles or bubbles here are clickable. Um, so if you have an active registration that will be expiring soon um, and you want to update and renew it, you would click on that active registrations bubble to navigate to a list of all your active registration. Your registration's already expired. You would click on the inactive and that'll filter to show you just your inactive entities. Um, if you want to just see every entity that you have roles to, regardless of the status, you can also click on the blue word entities at the top of the box. Anything in blue in SAM is clickable. So clicking there will just bring up all your entities regardless of status. Um, the key thing that I wanted to point out here is that if your organization has an existing UEI, no matter what status it is in, you will want to start the process by either clicking the renew update button or even better, I recommend just going to the entities link here in your workspace finding and navigating to the actual um, entity record or UEI that you want to register or renew and start from there. Do not click the get started button. Get started is for someone with a brand new business or entity. Um, so if you know your organization should have an existing registration, but you log into SAM and you're just not seeing it here in your workspace, 
that does not mean that it no longer exists in SAM necessarily. It likely means that you're just not assigned the role that you need to view and update it. Um, so then the first thing that you'll need to do is gain access to it. Um, so a common failure point we see is that sometimes folks will be like, I don't see it. Maybe I just need to click get started. Um, and they do that and end up inadvertently um, creating a duplicate UEI, which will cause um, you to fail in the registration process later on. Um, and fixing that data on the back end um, requires a little bit of, uh, well, it requires technical interv intervention, which takes more time um, and could really, you know, cause a delay. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so here um, we're seeing that the user has located their inactive registration that they want to update and renew. And we can see the status listed there as inactive registration. Um, it shows the date that it expired and became inactive. Um, so whether the address, which is blurred out here, um, is correct or needs an update, your step three is gonna be the same. You're gonna click on the actions menu which are those three vertical dots to the right of its expiration date, and you're gonna select update. And that'll start the update process um, for that specific entity record. Okay, next. Okay, so after selecting update from the action menus, you're gonna see a screen like this, letting you know um, that you're going to be, um, that you're about to get started. Um, and that you're going to be asked um, some questions initially. Um, you'll also uh, see that you'll be able to download a guide here that is, uh, includes a checklist and everything um, that you'll need to have prepared or, or be asked to provide. Um, so you know, if you haven't done this before, I recommend downloading the guide um, and just making sure that you're prepared because it is a, a lengthy process. Next. Okay, so before we continue the rest of the steps for renewing your registration, I'm gonna step back and quickly show the difference for someone who wants to register a brand new entity who is not in SAMDOC of. Um, so, okay, so this, um, again, this is the, the chart that shows all of the steps um, that you will go through um, if you're starting a brand new registration. Um, I'm gonna go about through about seven steps which will catch us up to uh, where updating um, an existing registration will be. Um, and you'll see uh, the differences, but also that, you know, we ask you a few more questions here. So next step. Okay, so once again, step one is the same here. You're going to go to sam.gov and click on the sign-in link. Um, but here we're assuming since you're starting a brand new registration that you may also be new to SAM. So we're telling you to click the create account button um, but of course, if you already have a SAM.gov login, you're just going to sign in with that email um, and password that you had already created. Okay, once you're signed in, um, you're going to uh, go to your workspace, as you saw before. Um, the difference is uh, now for you as uh, starting a new entity, um, you may not actually see any number. So if you don't have a role to any other entities and you're coming in for the first time with a new business or a new entity that you wanna register, um, these are probably all gonna say zero. Um, so uh, yeah, so in this instant, um, you're going to click the, you're gonna actually click the get start button, start button there to start from beginning. Um, next. And once you click get started, that's going to launch this welcome screen. Um, the welcome stream more to the left here is what you'll see. Um, and this is here, um, you know, we're, we're making sure that you know that you're about to create a new entity record. Um, and we're also telling you, like we did for updating for that path where you're updating existing, that we're going to ask you um, a few short questions to recommend um, the best option for the type of registration. Um, here at the bottom, before you click the, uh, to confirm that you want to create the new entity, um, we're also pointing out a few things. So one, you know, if you came here, you use the get started button. We hope you'll notice here that if you're trying to update an existing entity record, you should be going to your workspace and starting the path that I just showed you. Um, the other thing noted on the welcome screen is probably doesn't apply to this audience. Um, at all, but it's for international entities outside the US. They have to get an end cage before they start. 
Um, so it's telling them, hey, step back, you need to get that. And, and lastly, you also have access to download that guide that helps you prepare for the process. Um, so once you're ready to go, you would just uh, click the create new entity button um, to get started. And I'm showing, I was just showing also what you saw already, um, the difference. It's not that much difference for the update continue. Okay, go ahead, Alexis. Okay, uh, so the next question, so the, the, the question uh, here is what is your goal I want to do business with? And it has to do with the source of award funding. So from the federal government's perspective, um, the type of registration that you need in SAM depends on um, the kind of funding that you're seeking. So if you as a government entity are getting federal funding, you would select the first option directly with the US federal government. Or if you're doing business instead with another organization that's getting funds from the federal government, such as a subawardee to a prime awardee, you would pick the second option. Or we let you pick um, other here. Um, depending on which of the three options you pick on that first screen on the left, um, you're gonna get asked for more information. And the reason we're asking is because the requirement or the type of registration needed in SAM is actually different. Um, so if you're a prime contractor versus a sub awardee, the requirements and what you're going to, of the type of registration, what you're going to re be required to complete are going to be different. So these questions are meant um, to help us guide you down the right path for your specific situation. Um, next, okay. So, um, so if you select um, as shown here, the option to do business directly with the federal government, um, then you're going to get asked which of the items on the list here best match why you were here to register today. Um, so you can click on, we have those blue question marks in circles that are tool tips. Um, and if you can click on them if you're not sure about what we uh, mean for more help. So for example, um, if you're not sure what we mean by um, a prime, prime contractor, clicking on that little question mark is going to give you um, a definition of prime con contractor. Um, for apply for fi federal financial assistance, um, that question mark is going to show you more explanation about grants and loans and, and so on. Next. Okay, and, ne and next we're asking, who, we're asking you who told you to come to SAM? Um, and the answers here, um, as the other ones, they're anonymous and they're not part of your registration. Um, but in addition to helping guide you down the right path, they're also, this question here is helping us better understand what's driving you to come to SAM for registration. And it's helping us improve our services and training moving forward. So if you're wanting to deal with the federal government, which is the typical answer that the federal government told you to come, um, for example, the Department of Interior told me to register to apply, you know, for one of their grants, you would pick that. Um, but we've also had some state and local governments that are requiring businesses to register in SAM before they can do work with them. And often in this situation, um, the entity doesn't really have to go through the lengthy registration process. Um, they may only need to get the UEI itself. Next. Okay, so you get this screen now, which is new. Um, we've used a uh, plainer language here um, so that after you answer those questions, um, we've implemented this uh, subscription uh, style table that we believe is more recognizable and easier for you to understand. So depending on what you answered, we're going to recommend one of the three registration options by highlighting them in blue. Um, you can still look over what you get with each option on the left, um, as well as what you'll be expected to provide or why, would, why you would need um, each of those options. Um, and each of those has those blue circled um, tooltips um, where you can get more explanation for each of those items. Next, I think. Yeah, so we used to just ask straight up at the beginning of the registration, what is your purpose of registration and give you uh, the three options. And those three options are still here. They're here as the column headings. Um, so you're either gonna choose unique entity ID, financial assistance awards only, or all awards. 
Um, and while the recommendation that we highlight here is tailored based on your answers to the questions now, at this point, you can still choose any option. Um, and you would do that by cl uh, clicking that select button. So if you already have a registration or unique entity ID and you started down the update or renewal path, you're also going to answer the two prior questions because this is new functionality, um, but you're only going to have to answer them once. And then the next time you update, you won't see all those questions unless you're changing your purpose of registration, which, um, which is rare. Um, instead, um, the recommendations you're going to get are, are going to be, instead of a recommendation, what you're going to get is shown here. So you're going to see what your current purpose of registration is highlighted on your current SAM registration. And on the left, you're still going to get the same outline that shows what you get with each option um, and you know what, what you're going to, uh, when you would need it. Um, and this just gives you the opportunity to change your mind and say, okay, well, I was registered for all awards last time, but I really didn't need all that. So I'm going to downgrade it to financial assistance awards only this time, or, you know, or maybe vice versa, you were financial assistance awards only, but now you're looking to uh, compete for um, DOD awards. Next. Okay, then in the next step, uh, we're asking if you are registering a government entity. Um, and this is not, we're not asking if you're the federal government, we mean, are you a state, local, tribal, or foreign government? Um, and that's because governments have different uh, requirements than for-profit industry. So in this example, we're selecting tribal government for demonstration purposes, um, but obviously, um, you know, tri the tribal government may not apply to you. Um, on the screen, um, you'll see, I'm not sure if you could see it because the text is small, but we define exactly what tribal government refers to and when you uh, should select it. Next. And then the next question we're asking is, do you already have a cage code? So if you're brand new, uh, starting a new registration, you probably do not have one um, and you should select no. Um, the system is going to decide later on the process if you need one. Um, at this point, um, you know, if you're doing grants only and you answer a question that you're not planning to apply for any grants from DOD, then there's usually not a need for you to have a cage code and you won't be assigned one. Um, but if you apply for all awards, then later in the process, you'll see um, that you will go out, your registration will go to DLA to get that assigned. Um, however, if you do have a cage code, um, oftentimes this is, you know, for international entities that have to get their end cage before they start, um, you would select yes, because, you know, if you were already assigned a cage code for whatever reason and you're coming in new, you're going to need to sync that up with the Defense Logistics Agency system. Okay, next. All right, so starting validation. So this is where most of the confusion and challenges um, I've seen have been experienced, um, which makes sense because it's a brand new process, um, not a year old yet. So I wanna provide some context on what we mean by validation, why it's so important um, and, and what we're doing to make it less challenging um, for you as tribal governments and native owned businesses. Next slide. Okay, uh, so first, a lot of people tend to use the term validation interchangeably with registration, um, but they're not really the same thing. As you see in this um, overall registration pro process, validation happens sort of at the beginning, but it's actually shown here as step eight and nine. So whether you're coming in to start a brand new registration or updating an existing one, you will be asked to enter your entity information to begin the validation process. Um, now, if you've already been validated and your business address and uh, business name and address has not changed, the system will still validate you, but it's going to do it automatically through data sources and you'll continue through the rest of the registration process. Um, but in most cases, I'll explain, um, most people may need to submit uh, validation documents first. Um, the good news is that you should only need to do this step uh, where the documents are needed one time 
unless you la later on change your business name or move to a new physical address. Uh, next slide. Okay, another point of confusion is that the validation is specifically handled through a third party company that we hired to confirm your entity actually exists and that it is, um, it is unique as required by federal regulation. So the uniqueness of your entity is determined by a combination of your legal business name and your physical address. And the reason um, why even registrants, like you may say, I'm already active, I've had no changes to my registration. Um, why am I being required to provide documentation? And the reason for that is when the federal government required SAM.gov to provide the standardized um, UEI, we not only changed service providers, we also brought the validation process into SAM.gov and we needed to start building a brand new database of validated entity information. Unfortunately, um, we could not use the old data. So validation is required um, for us to validate that your entity is what you say it is and that it's unique. Um, and it's really intended to help uh, prevent fraud um, and, and to ensure that federal awards are going to, you know, who they should be going to. Um, while I mentioned that you only need to provide the documentation part of it once, um, you will still be going through validation every time you renew. It's just that the next time your validated entity will already be in our entity validation service database. So the system will, you know, find you get an exact match and shepherd you um, straight through validation without asking you for documentation again. Um, this this last year, you know, I know has been a challenge for people and, and we understand and we're doing our best to make improvements um, to the process to make it more easier to move forward. Um, but sometimes, you know, while it may be seemed, you know, it may seem like we're doing this to torture entities. It, it's not for that reason. Um, it's very, it's just a very critical part of the federal awards ecosystem. Um, Validation is really important. We're dealing with the disbursement of a lot of federal money, and we need to make sure that we're not enabling, you know, people who may be engaged in fraud. So GSA is entrusted with managing SAM.gov and, and being good stewards of this data. So we take the responsibility extremely seriously. Um, we don't own the data. We know that you, the entities, own your data and federal agencies own their data, but we're responsible for ensuring um, data integrity for both you, know, you as the entity and the federal agency, um, whether it's contracting officers or grants offers, officers that are relying on this data to make sure that they're awarding and distributing funding to the right businesses and the right people at those businesses. Um, so that's why we need to validate your entity. Next. Okay, so starting validation, we're gonna, um, I'm gonna show you the screens and what this actually looks like. Next. Okay, so if you remember where we left off, you had selected which registration option you wanted to proceed with, whether it was UEI only, financial assistance awards, or all awards. Um, when you click, um, when you select that, make that selection, it's going to take you to this enter your entity detail screen. Um, and if you're starting a brand new registration or getting a brand new UEI, your screen's going to look like the one on the left. Um, if you're updating an existing registration, then it's going to look like the one on the right, which is basically the same, except that if you already have an existing um, registration, it's going to show you um, what your details currently look like in SAM at the top. Um, so in either case, what you're doing here is you're entering your details so you can search to see if we can find your information um, in uh, already validated uh, and in our uh, entity validation service providers database. So you're going to enter your legal business name and your physical address. Um, doing business as is optional. The only thing I'll point out that sometimes uh, people make a mistake here is that you know, they may think, oh, it's optional. I could put my acronym in here, or I could put the name of my division, which is different than my other entities division. Um, that is not to be used here. A doing business as is a legitimate thing. Um, so if you put a DBA here, you're going to be later asked for documentation, such as, you know, something from the Secretary of State or a bank statement or something that shows that doing business name as. Um, so if you don't have a DBA, leave it blank. 
Um, all right, once you enter uh, your entity details exactly as they um, you know, appear on your documentation, you're gonna click next and the search will be performed. Um, so you're gonna get this legal entities list that you see on the right. Um, some of you will find your information and some won't find any information, even if you're already in SAM. And, and this is normal because of the change that I mentioned. Um, you're gonna look at this list carefully and you're only gonna select an entity if you know that it's yours. If you're not sure if what comes up is your entity or not, then you're gonna select, I don't recognize my entity in the list. Um, it may not be perfect. So if you do see a match, but it's missing something minor, like a suite number or has a typo, or you see your entity with your old address, but you moved and you're now at a new address, as long as you know that that's your entity, you can still click, you should still click, I recognize my entity in the list because you will be given an opportunity to correct the details, um, which you'll see on this next slide. Um, so if here, if you selected, I recognize my entity in the list, um, you get to move on um, to these screens. Um, on the left screen, if everything looks perfect, um, you know, you're gonna select yes, all details are correct. Um, and then you're going to click next and move on. But if something is not quite right, as shown here, you're going to select no, some of the details are not correct. Um, and you'll get the screen on the right where you'll tell us um, exactly what's not correct and enter what your you know, legal business name or your address um, should be uh, corrected to. Um, again, um, be sure that what you enter here is going to match your official documentation um, because you'll you'll need to uh, match in order to get through the process uh, more quickly. Next. Okay, so here you'll provide your entity start year and place of incorporate, um, state of incorporation. Um, we know that this question has also been challenging um, for some. You do not have to be a corporation to fill this out. So we understand, for example, that, you know, as a, go a tribal government, um, you may not have an incorporation date. So what we're really asking for here is the date that you were established and in which state you were established. So the date um, would be one that is on any document that shows when you were established, such as a charter or some type of articles of uh, formation. Next. Okay, so this, if you get to this screen, um, it means that your entity information uh, was not available in our database or needs to be updated in the entity validation or EBS database. Again, um, this is normal. Um, it's just that we couldn't use our existing data source um, to validate you. So we're going to have to do a manual review of your documentation. Um, so this is where you're going to provide uh, the official documents to prove uh, the, the corrected entity information that you typed in on the previous screen. Um, at the top under review requirements, there's a blue link um, and you can click that to view a list of some of the common acceptable um, documents that our EVS team will accept for validation. Um, but if you have, um, in terms of attaching documents, if you have a single document that shows your legal business name, your physical address, and the year and state that you started all in the same document, then you only need one document. But in most cases, we see that, that folks need more than one document and that's okay. It, they don't, you don't have to have everything in one document. We can connect the dots. Um, what we do need um, you to provide is at least one document that has the legal business name and the physical address together in the same document, the physical address that you're requesting in the same document. Um, you can have another document that shows legal business name and year established. Um, and then we also need a, a document that shows legal business name and state where you were established. Of course, if you have a document that has your legal business name and the year and state you were established, then you could just do that with one document. You don't need three. Hopefully that's, that's clear. And then we'll connect the dots behind the scenes. Um, the key takeaway on this screen is to provide as much as you have here um, and then to let us know in that provide details uh, box um, if you're having any specific documentation challenges or, you know, other information that you may have to help our EVS team get you um, validated as quickly as, as possible. Next. 
Um, so I mentioned that that first link had um, some of the common documents. There's a blue link at the bottom of this screen, uh, which takes you to a knowledge article that has a more comprehensive list um, and checklist of all the different acceptable document types and which documents are often used to prove which things that we need to know. Um, the most common types of documents that work for most are bank statements or, or utility bills. Um, and with these, the documents need to be less than five years old. Um, but of course, the more recent, the better. Um, for the utility bills, what we're looking for here is the legal business name to be shown along with your service address that matches the physical address you're requesting. Um, for any of the financial documents, especially like a bank statement or a tax return, you can redact or black out the financial information. Um, we don't need to see any of that. We just need to look um, and prove your business name and legal physical address. Um, and then here we've also listed some of the acceptable documents um, that tribal affiliated entities um, have been able to submit in the past um, to get through the validation, um, especially um, with challenges to support the start year and state. Next. Okay, uh, for those of you uh, that are located in extremely rural locations, um, we do understand uh, that you have, um, may have many challenges with providing acceptable documentation that supports the physical address requirement. Um, like for example, you know, you may only have a PO box which we do not accept for validation purposes, um, or maybe you have a rural route number. I've seen in rural areas where you only use a PO box, but you do have a road that you're on that you could possibly use for the address, but you're not able to, none of your acceptable documentation types show that. Um, so what I'll say here is just give us whatever you have that will help prove what you're telling us. and. And that is better than nothing because at least at that point when you we get your incident, we know that um, you know we at least know this is a legitimate entity that we're dealing with, um, and we can start to explore other options to get you validated. Um, and so this list here again is some some alternate alternate documents that would be helpful to upload if you can, uh, rather than nothing at all. Um, so declarations published from official tribal records. Um, a formal resolution from a tribal council, treaties or laws um, related to when you were formed, um, a, even a screenshot of your verifiable official tribal website with information about your entity. So I think there are some tribes that have the nsn.gov uh, domain, uh, so a website like that. Um, rat you know, a ratified approval of a charter for a se Section 17 corporation. Um, Okay, so next. All right, so this is the screen where you're actually gonna upload the documentation that you have. You can add more than one document um, and you'll do that by clicking the add document button where you'll be able to tell us more about each document that you're uploading. I'll show you on the next slide. Um, so after you click the add document, first you're going to select uh, what kind of document are you uploading from the list provided. If you're uploading one of those alternate um, document types, um, you have the option to choose other documents. So just do that. Um, then check which of the three requirements the document meets. Um, so in this example, there, there's um, attaching a state certificate, a filing document which shows their legal business name and address, but it doesn't show the start year or state. So they're just able to check one of the boxes and then attach the document. And then on the next slide, I think, yes, on the next slide, um, we're showing that uh, they're able to attach one more document and check off two more requirements. So here they're attaching the articles of incorporation and they're telling us that that has a legal business name, DBA in the same document and a legal business name and start year um, in the same document. And so at this point, um, they have checked all three check boxes, which you must check all three check boxes in order to submit the validation request. Um, and then next slide. Okay, and the next slide I wanted to point out again, this is provide details, it's optional 
but it really, for you, I recommend that you treat it as not optional and use this to explain your case as clearly as possible. Um, we have had situations where, you know, someone doesn't have a USPS physical address, um, only a PO box, the utility bill shows the poll only um, as the service address, and all the other documentation shows the PO box, but they have a website that shows, you know, the actual road that they're on. Um, so in that case, you know, we still need you to upload something, so, or the system won't let you proceed. So we would say upload what you have. Um, it worst case, you could even upload a document that explains your situation um, to get you into our system. Um, but our entity validation team is going to read your comments here. They're going to review your documents. Uh, and, and when they have questions, they're going to come to me or my director or someone that's on our team um, to ask us for help. And, and we'll be able to figure out the best path forward for you. Next. Okay, so once you submit the documents, um, you'll see this screen uh, that confirms that your documents have been submitted to us um, or to our entity validation service. Um, currently, it takes about five business days on average uh, for them to process your validation documentation. So these are uh, real people who are manually reviewing your documents. So it's not um, you know, an instantaneous system thing. You upload your documents and you're gonna hear back. Um, but we are, you know, uh, averaging within three to five business days, depending on volume uh, at this point. Um, you will get uh, this reference number that begins with INC-GSAFSD, um, as well as an email confirmation with this number. So if you've um, done business with us before and you've called the Federal Service Desk or what we refer to as FSD, you're going to recognize this as an FSD ticket number. Um, however, these tickets created in SAM are, are going into um, a separate bucket only that only our entity validation service can see, um, and that's to protect um, you and any personally identifiable information that you have submitted in your documents. Uh, so if you call the FSD, um, they'll be able to give you um, sort of like the high level status of where your ticket is or that it's in there, but they're not really going to be able to answer specific questions about your documentation or validation. It's best to reply directly to that email um, that you get with this reference number on it or go into go back into SAM where you'll be able to view the status and, and add documentation to it. Um, you will still get emails about this incident from FSD support at gsa.gov just like you would for any other incident, and you'll be able to respond to that email, you know, as you would um, to reach the entity validation um, service uh, agent. Next slide. Okay, so here's an example of a communication about your validation that you might get um, via email. Um, so, you know, monitor your email closely because you'll want to know, um, you know, if if they need more. Like in this case, it's not the best news in that they weren't able to say, yay, we have everything you need. We've done the update, but they're letting you know that they need something else. And, um, you know, um, you can provide the additional documentation or if you're having challenges with that, um, at least reply back to let them know that you need more time or let them know that you don't have any other documentation and need help. Um, because as long as you reply to them within the five business days, then your ticket will not automatically close um, and, and we'll be able to work with you on next steps. Um, next. So at, at some point, I don't have a, an image of it, but at some point you're gonna get the email that says, you know, we've uh, successfully validated your entity and we've updated our database. And they're gonna list out in that email your entity details as they were updated for you on our end. Um, and then they're gonna provide you instructions on what you need to do next. And I'm gonna walk you through those instructions or next steps. Um, so basically, um, the instructions are gonna be that you're gonna come back into sign into sam.gov and you're gonna go through the validations it steps again, um, starting from your workspace. Um, but this time the difference is gonna be that you're gonna find an exact match for your entity and you're gonna be able to continue through um, the registration process without needing to provide any more documentation. 
Um, so let's go to the next slide. And I, I think we're just gonna quickly show you, um, you know, how, what you do depending on your status, but these instructions again will be provided by the EVS agent. Um, so here it's showing um, someone who's uh, trying to get a brand new UEI when they started the process. Um, your entity status is going to show pending ID assignment because you went through the process once already. Um, but as you'll see, um, there's no UEI listed here because it hasn't been assigned yet. It was waiting on the validation to take place. So what you're going to do is after you get that email with your entity details having been updated, you're gonna select the get started button again as if you're starting over from scratch. Um, and this time when you get to that enter, enter entity details information, um, you're gonna enter it exactly as they listed it in the email confirmation. And you're gonna get that listing returned to you and you're gonna find an exact match and continue on. So next. Um, this is if you have a UEI assigned but had no registration, your entity is going to show an ID assigned status. Um, and, and the next few are going to be the same. You're going to start from the workspace. You're going to find your ID assigned record and you're going to click um, that update from the action menu to the right of that entity record. And that'll take you through the, to the next steps. Um, next, sometimes with an ID assigned record, um, you're going to see this yellow validation required alert. So when you click on the three vertical dots uh, for your registration, you're going to select validate entity there. And that's gonna bring up your um, entity updated information that you'll confirm is correct and you'll be able to continue through. Next, okay. So whether you have an inactive or an active registration, um, it's, it's the process is gonna be the same. Um, you're going to find that record and you're going to click on the three vertical dots to the right of the expiration date known as the action menu and you're going to click select the update link. Um, you're going to be prompted to enter your entity details um, and I recommend you enter them as they are in the email and it should return an exact match and you'll be able to continue. And lastly, I know this is a bit repetitive, uh, but I just wanted you to see that there, you know, there's different statuses. Um, but if your entity shows as a work in progress status, usually this happened um, because you had already validated your information, but it wasn't correct um, and you haven't finished completing it yet, or you failed at one of the external verifications later on in the process after you submitted your registration because it was incorrect, which will bring it into this work in progress status. Um, so here, um, this can be a little tricky. Sometimes the first thing you would do is come in the same as you did with active and inactive registration and you would try the update action. Um, if it takes you right to the registration and it doesn't bring up the new information, it doesn't prompt you to update it, then you may have to come back here to the action menu and actually delete the work in progress registration, um, which will bring it back to whatever your prior status was, whether it was active, inactive or ID assigned. Um, and then you would select update just like you did on, you know, for the other ones. Okay, all right. So this slide and the next slide are the most uh, rewarding screens for everyone um, because they are what you will see when you have successfully completed the validation process, um, which you will only have to do one time. So if you took the get started path for a brand new UEI or registration, you're going to see these screens. Um, you'll see the entity you selected has the information that you provided, and you'll be given the option um, to be included in the public search. Um, once you make this decision, um, you'll also have to check the box at the bottom, which is certifying that you actually have the authority to take action for this entity you will then be able to click the receive unique entity ID green button. Um, and then the screen on the right will, will appear for with your new UEI number assigned that we have blurred out here. Um, and at this point, you're either going to click the button to return to your workspace if all you needed was the UEI and you're good, or if you needed to also register for federal financial assistance awards or all awards, you'll be able to click the continue registration button to move on from validation. And next is 
Okay, so this is the screen that you see for success if you were on the other path where you uh, started out with an existing registration or UAI and you were basically just updating that record. Um, and here you're also able to opt in or out of the public search and you'll click the button to continue renewing the registration. Okay, uh, we do get often asked about, you know, should I opt in or opt out of the public search? Um, if you uncheck the box, then you're opting out of the public search, which means only you and federal government users can see your entity on SAM.gov. Um, so other state and local government agencies or, you know, other organizations that may need to confirm your entity will not be able to view it on SAM.gov search. Um, so, for example, if a prime contractor is looking for a subawardee, they won't be able to find you when they do the search in SAM. Um, however, all information, even if you opt out, is available under the Freedom of Information Act, FOIA, um, and it's also included in our data extracts and API data. Um, the reason we offer this option is, is, is really for situations. For example, there's some entities that work in um, with the military, uh, where maybe it may be dangerous for them to be identified publicly, um, but it's completely your option. If you do keep the checkbox selected, um, it'll show non-sensitive information like your registration status, legal business name, and physical address, um, and it's only going to show it to users who sign into SAM.gov and who are searching for en entity information. Um, it won't show any of the sensitive like your banking or financial information. Um, most do keep it checked, but uh, it's it's completely your option. You can also change it later if you like. Next slide. Um, so after validation uh, is completed, when you're um, going in to continue your registration, you're going to be asked about your relationship to the entity. Um, the reason for this question is that uh, pretty recently, we now require anyone with the entity administrator role to be an employee or an officer of the company um, or entity. There are, um, there are uh, third party consultants um, that uh, some entities choose to manage their SAM registration for them for fee. Um, and you know, you're welcome to do that, um, but they may not, the third party entity users may not be granted the entity administrator role for your entity any longer. Um, here, what we're trying to find out is if the person doing the registration is a third party entity or actually representative of your uh, company or entity. Um, we have a link here on this page, which explains in a lot of detail why we care. But if you as the entity administrator are choosing to hire a third party, you can give them the data entry role instead, and they'll still be able to do everything they did for you before. The only thing they can't do now is assign others roles to that entity. Um, so only an employer or officer of the company can hold the entity admin role to assign roles to other um, people within, you know, as need, other people as needed. Um, next. Okay, now that we're done with validation, um, we need to complete the registration process, um, unless of course you only need a UAI. Um, so this first page tells you what information you're going to be filling out um, and you're gonna click continue um, on the bottom left to move to the next page and begin filling out the first section, which is the core data pages. Um, if you're renewing an existing registration, then all of these pages are gonna be pre-populated for you with what's currently in SAM um, already. Um, the only time it's gonna be completely blank like this is if you're starting from scratch with a brand new entity. Um, and then all of the fields that have that little red uh, asterisk or star next to them, those are mandatory. Um, the, the rest are optional. So you're gonna have to fill in the ones with the red stars before it'll let you continue to the next page. Um, and then on the left-hand side, um, you're gonna see that, uh, that menu, um, like it says core data, business information, cage or end cage. Um, and after that, you're gonna see reps and certs and points of contact. Um, that's going to show you with check marks and arrows where you are along the entire process. Um, and the last thing I'll mention too is if you get started and you're midway through this and you're like, I don't have that information, if you click go back to your workspace, your registration will be put in the work in progress status. 
you'll be able to go to that action menu for it later and click update and it'll bring you back um, you know, to where you were to complete the rest of it and submit it. Um, next. And I'm not gonna go through all the pages here. I'm just gonna um, point out a few um, key things um, that we wanna highlight. Um, so on this uh, general information page, uh, the first selection that you want to pay attention to is the institution type. Um, if you're a native owned business um, and, and in some case tribal government, you're going to select not applicable here. Um, it will alter the information that you need to provide to us later on. Um, and so we're trying to make sure that you're going down the right path and getting asked the right questions moving forward. Um, the other selection to pay close attention to is the Native American entity type. Um, the screens currently say, and it's a mistake, to choose all that apply, um, but you should only choose one. You can only legally be one of these. So, um, you know, and the reason that you want to get this right is because it's going to differentiate the funding pool that you belong in and also um, how you're going to appear in different search engines that are being built within GSA um, and even I think the Department of Interior Systems. Um, next. Um, so this is the version, uh, this is another version of the general information page that a tribal government entity will see. Um, and as you see here, um, that for a tribal government, you're going to have multiple government types that may apply. Um, and you'll still have the institution type um, listed here and the Native American types where you should only select one Amer Native American type. Next. Okay, so if your entity is a tribal college or a university, um, you're able to get access to state programs um, by identifying um, in the institution type as an educational institution. Um, and then, as you'll see um, demonstrated here, if you select educational institution for the institution type, then you're going to um, activate some uh, additional choices that you'll be able to select, like you have tribal colleges, land grant colleges listed, HBCUs, and all kinds of um, things that apply to you in this section. If you don't, you know, if you fail to select educational institution in your tribal college, then you won't get those selections um, and be um, have access to those state programs. Next. Okay, as the GSA uh, and the Department of Interior are beginning to roll out more by Indian Act tools, um, search tools, it's gonna be even more important for you to have this information entered correctly for your entity. Um, so I wanted to highlight that these uh, search engines for these tools that are being developed are going to um, come from the SAM data and what you put on your registration. Um, so having this correct is going to increase visibility to you as a business uh, within the categories that you should be found under. Um, so again, you want to be sure you're filling this out correctly so you can get full and fair access to the federal market. Um, after institution type, the first selection um, to highlight here is this disadvantaged business enterprise from the Department of Transportation program. So if you're a member of that program, you want to make sure you select yes here, um, but only if you're a member of the program, um, because that's how you're going to get notices of new opportunities inside of that program. Uh, separate from that, um, as you look at your Native American entity types here, um, you should only select one, as we said, but you're going to make sure that you select the correct one that applies to you. Um, you know, I think it's uh, July, GSA's government-wide market research tools that you may have heard of uh, for federal buyers, uh, government-wide, uh, eBuy, eLibrary, GSA Advantage. Um, they're going to have new searching abilities enabled by this information. So if a contracting officer is looking to take advantage, for example, of an 8A direct award authorities for their procurement, um, they're gonna either use the SAM search that we have, or they're gonna use these GSA tools to identify the entities that qualify. And if you're not listed correctly in SAM, you could be disqualified um, from taking part in that acquisition. Um, also as shown here on the side, we're listing out um, and highlighting the differences in the types of advantages or opportunities that are available 
Um, for uh, example, Alaska Native owned corporations are tribally owned versus American Indian owned. Um, and then NHOs, ANCs, and tribally owned firm also have specific 8A procurement rules under DOD. So selecting um, the correct type here, if it applies to you, is important because it opens you up to these opportunities. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, and as I mentioned, uh, you can only legally be one of these entity types. Um, and this is highlighting that as an Alaska Native corporation owned firm, you're gonna select this. Um, if your entity is an Alaska Native regional corporation or an Alaska Native village doing business with the federal government, American Indian owned, you're gonna select this if you as an individual are enrolled in a federally recognized tribe or are a shareholder in an Alaska Native village and are owning a business. Um, Indian tribe federally recognized, this is you as the tribal government or Alaska Native village entity. Um, and then the um, Native Hawaiian organization owned for, firm, these are your entities uh, that are participating as for-profit entities tied to a Native Hawaiian board owned uh, nonprofit. And then tribally owned firm, uh, firm, for example, a section 17 corporation, which is wholly owned by a tribe, but is separate and distinct from the tribal governments. Um, and the key here is that you have to be 51% or greater um, in ownership. If you are less than that in the ownership, then you should not be under these categories. Um, and I'm not sure if I have a slide on this, but we're, we're highlighting this as, you know, selecting the right thing to get access to these opportunities, but you want to make sure you're selecting these accurately because later in the reps insert section, you're going to be certifying, um, you know, and you could be subject to criminal penalties if you um, select something that you are not, um, it, you know, should not be selecting. Next slide. Um, under entity structure here, um, this also applies. You're gonna be, need to be sure that you're selecting the correct option and if you are for profit or not for profit. So on this slide, um, because I know there's a lot of complication here on this slide, we've provided a link to the Bureau of Indian Affairs webpage where it um, lists information to help you choose the right business structure for your entity. Next. And this is the list of social economic categories as they exist from SBA, Small Business Administration. Um, the minority owned business applies to tribally owned businesses. So you can select this if your business is owned uh, by 51% or greater uh, minority group members. Um, and then if you select that, you're going to select a subcategory that best represents primary ownership for your entity. So uh, if you are American Indian owned, tribally owned or Alaska Native Corporation, um, you will also qualify under the Indian Economic Enterprise. Um, so it's important to select that as well if you qualify under it, um, because as an Indian economic enterprise, you can receive procurement set asides under the Buy Indian Act. Um, and there is a new dashboard that's being released by Bureau of Indian Affairs for Department of Interior to be able to search uh, by this specific subcategory for set asides. And um, as I mentioned, you're going to certify to these answers later in the representative um, representations and certifications. Um, so, you know, I'm not showing this to have you misrepresent your entity, entity um, in order to get a contract or any of this funding. I'm just pointing them out because many of you um, will actually um, uh, apply, you know, these will apply for you. So you want to make sure that you are aware and checking them off so that you can uh, get access to the funding uh, you're entitled to. Next. Okay, so now we've gotten through the core data and we are now under the representation and certifications. Um, these reps and certs that you have to fill out are going to change and will vary based on how you answered and described your entity and the other core data pages um, and the type of registration you're doing. So you're going to review each one and are basically checking the box at the bottom to certify that you read them um, and understand that they all apply to you. Um, next. And then part of the reps asserts that may apply to you uh, based on your registration or specific of uh, federal acquisition regulation or FAR responses. 
Um, again, the ones with the red stars are mandatory selections. Um, some of these may be grayed out, but become activated for you to answer based on um, what you answer to a prior question. Next. Okay, and then after reps and certs, you're gonna requ be required to enter three points of context, an accounts receivable POC, an electronic business POC, and a government POC. Um, first of all, these are separate from you as the entity administrator. Um, entering someone's name in here does not grant them a, a role or an account in SAM.gov to make updates to your entity record. That is actually done elsewhere through the user directory in SAM. Um, but rather, these are for um, these contacts are for government um, officials and other contracting officers that may be reaching out to you. Um, it's okay if the same person, your you know, your organization is small and you're the entity administrator, and you're also all of these things. That's okay, or they can be different people. Um, the one I do want to point out um, is the government uh, business point of contact. That one is the POC that the Defense Logistics Agency or DLA will reach out to if you're also needing a cage code and they need more information. Um, and they will require for you to respond uh, to any request for information after you submit your registration um, within an appointed time, usually three days. Um, so you wanna make sure that whoever you list here, if it's you or not you, that that person is aware um, during that time to be monitoring their email from any emails from a DLA.MIL address, mil, um, in case more information is requested so that you don't fail at that step. Next. And once you've gotten through all of the pages, you're gonna to get to this final review um, and submit page. Um, you want to, um, you don't wanna uh, stop here yet. You wanna scroll all the way to the bottom and click and make sure you click the submit button. Um, once you, um, next slide, once you submit, click the submit button, you're going to get this pop up and click the send password button, at which point a one time six digit OTP code will be sent to your email address. It's going to be the email address that you logged into SAM with. Um, and you'll get that email and enter that six digit code. Um, and at that point, you will be submitted. Next. And okay, so this is the confirmation page that you're going to get. Um, you're also going to get an email with all of this information. Um, there's a timestamp there. Um, it tells you what's going to happen next, which I'll go into a little bit. Next. Um, so, okay, so what happens next? So after you submit your registration, your status, if you remember in the beginning in your workspace, is going to show a submitted registration. Um, it is still processing at this time. So first, it's going to go to the IRS for their verification of your taxpayer identification number. So whether you entered an EIN or a Social Security number for your sole proprietorship, it's going to do a match on that. And it's also going to do a match on your taxpayer name. So you want to be sure that your taxpayer name um, matches exactly as the IRS has it on file for you. Um, usually uh, you're entering that on the IRS consent form and usually that's gonna be what was on your last tax filing. So the IRS verification is automated and it takes approximately two business days. After you uh, hopefully pass the IRS verification, um, then it goes to the Defense Logistics Agency or DLA to create or update your CAGE code information if that is required for you based on the type of registration you're doing. Um, this is the longest verification step, uh, taking approximately 10 to 15 days. Um, and during this time, um, you should be sure that the government POC, as I mentioned earlier, um, that's listed on your registration is gonna be on the lookout uh, for any emails from DLA.mil um, in case they request information or documentation to complete their review. And then once it passes both of the step uh, 12 and 13 here, um, your registration will automatically become active. Um, and it's gonna have a new expiration date that is one year from the date that it was submitted. Um, and you'll get an email from um, update from sam.gov at each step telling you where it is in the process. 
Um, and if you fail at either IRS or CAGE, um, your registration is going to return to work in progress status so that you'll be able to go in and update and make any corrections as needed to resubmit it. Um, and generally, if you fail at DLA CAGE, it's going to be because you either need to um, make a correction to your legal business name or your address, although sometimes it can also fail um, because you fail to respond within the uh, allotted time frame to their request for more information. But if you do need a change in SAM, then we'll be able to help you with that. And next. And lastly, before we get to questions, um, we have several ways that you can get more help. Um, first, on the SAM.gov page uh, itself, uh, on the top menu, there's an option for help, which takes you to the page you see here. Um, there's, uh, you know, a lot of validation help here um, and some frequently asked questions. You can also see that button. It says, ask the federal service desk, go to FSD. Um, so you can use that link to go to the federal service desk page. Next slide. Um, and FSD is not just a help desk, but it's also our repository, uh, repository of knowledge articles and user guides. Um, this is here showing you the FSD main page. Um, and as you can see in the middle there, we've broken out the most popular topics um, under how to register your entity. Um, but you can also enter a phrase or keyword in that search bar to find um, answers to any questions you are looking for. Um, we also have videos in here, um, short videos on specific topics. And next. And the last thing I wanted to raise awareness about was um, not fun. It's about online scams and fraudulent schemes that are targeting government systems users. Um, so there are some third party companies that will, you know, offer to help register your entity in SAM.gov for a fee. Um, so registration in SAM.gov is always free you do not need to hire a third party company or pay a fee. However, um, some users, there are some legitimate companies out there that will help you with your SAM registration. And some users may find that beneficial even for the fee. Um, but you should always be on the lookout for disreputable ones, right? Like when you're going to hire a new contractor or something, you wanna make sure that they're legitimate and they're just not trying to trick you into taking your money and then they won't actually do help you with your SAM.gov registration. Um, there's also phishing schemes and things where um, they're trying to get um, information that is in your SAM registration, like um, you know, bank account numbers, social security numbers, um, employees' names, email address. So you always have to be aware um, that you're who you're talking to and who you're working with. So I wanted to point out that any email that you get, because sometimes the marketing emails you get, the scam emails, or they're, they're just, they make it sound like you need to urgently do something or we're going to cancel your registration. Um, you should always check your registration on your own, but if in doubt, you can go to fsd.gov and ask us. Um, but any email that you're going to get about your registration will come from a GOV, a .gov email address. Um, so check the sender's email. If they have something, um, if it doesn't end in .gov or .mil for the military, then it's not from a government. Sometimes you'll you'll see a link and it's from a dot, like a .gov.com where they're trying to make it look like it's a government entity. So just wanted to highlight that um, for you to be careful. And next, I think we're almost through. Um, yeah, and here we're just, um, as Alexis mentioned at the very beginning, we strongly recommend that you subscribe to our blog. Um, we're always making improvements to the system and this is where we're posting any important updates about system changes um, that we're about to make so that you're not caught off guard. And that is the end of the formal presentation. So I think Salome and others have been answering some questions. Um, if you still have questions, I'm gonna go through and see if I can answer a few more for you. Let's see. Uh, okay, so. Um, I think Salome is typing this, but I'll answer it live. So we have three, um, someone says we have three UEIs and three SAM.gov accounts. Is it really on, only one entity? Can we merge the three records? Um, so, so for whatever reason with the old process there, because of when we transitioned in April from Dun & Bradstreet, 
If an entity already had a DUNS number, then they automatically got a UEI. But now that we're going through validation, we're catching situations where um, there are multiple entities with the same legal business name and same exact physical address um, that are duplicates that do not meet the legal definition of uniqueness. Um, so at, at this point, what we're doing is we're working with the entities to see if they are, you know, if they have, if you have acceptable documentation that shows that, okay, these are separate entities, maybe you have a corporate office at one location and you have a couple branches at a different physical address, um, but maybe it's just a matter of your documentation challenges to prove that. That's one thing we can work with you um, to create three, you know, to update your three separate entities. But if there is no um, legitimate uniqueness to these entities, we are going to um, ask you to um, consolidate them um, and um, move down to one uh, UEI and, and subsequently one cage if it's for all awards. Uh, one of our other Okay, so I'm not sure. So there's a question about um, a SAM entity administrator having a different email address, which is preventing perhaps them seeing um, the roles that they have or, or seeing their entity maybe. Um, hopefully I understand the question. But in SAM.gov, uh, roles are tied to an email address. So in order to get a role to the entity, um, that you manage, you need to have an account in SAM.gov um, and that with an email address, um, there's authentication methods set up when you log in with that email address. If you change your email address and you do it the wrong way, that could sometimes cause a problem. So what we recommend is if you're the entity administrator and you're going to change your email address, you wanna first assign your new email address, the role, and, and then go ahead and change it. Um, but if you had an entity administrator that left the organization and is no longer there to assign you uh, as the new person managing um, the entity, the role, then you'll have to uh, submit a notarized letter. Um, and we can send out that link with that template and how to do that um, when we send out the Q&A. Um, but the easiest thing to do is to make sure that before someone leaves, they assign someone else the entity administrator role. You can also have more than one person with an entity administrator role, and we recommend that so that you have a backup in case someone's no longer available so that you don't have to go um, through the, the process of getting the, the letter, um, which requires notarization, et cetera. Um, How do you submit authorized users for SAM profiles? Um, so I think this speaks to the roles question again. Um, so basically, if, if there is an existing entity administrator on uh, assigned to your entity, you can request the role be assigned to you from them as a user. Um, if you um, if the entity administrator is not available to directly assign you the role in their user directory in SAM, um, then you will need to um, submit an entity appointment letter. Um, and, and Salome is typing, so I think she's going to send uh, out the link to how to do that. Uh, uh, actually, I didn't. I'm sorry. Oh, you didn't. Okay. <laughs> I can I share that it. link. Okay. Um, I did get the, uh, I did look at the question about um, if the tribe owns the utility company and is a credit check required, I'm not sure about that question, but I'm kind of curious as to who would tell them that the utility document was not sufficient. Uh, 
the the name on the ticket is Gleba. Oh, I think they're saying that the tribe itself owns the utility company. Right. And so they're submitting a utility bill that oh, they created. kind of a circular logic. I, I'm valid because I say I'm valid. Is that it? Yes. <laughs> so um, that is an interesting one. I'm actually putting together, by the way, I'm sorry I joined late. My name is Salome. I'm the director of the Division of the uh, Outreach and Stakeholder Engagement. But I'm actually starting up a working group with different agencies, including uh, BIA, to try to figure out what we can do for these entities who are getting tripped up uh, you know, along the way with their SAM registrations. And that is one thing that we are looking into, you know, who, who says what is okay and, and who is the authoritative source for the tribes. So I am going to, uh, add that question to my working group list. And, uh, so I don't have an answer for you now, but we are going to work on that. Okay. And we have another notarized letter question. Is a notarized letter required when signing up? Um, references it in the email, but I can't determine if it's required or may be required. So you you may not you may not be required. It depends. So I have seen folks submit a notarized letter and wait for it to be reviewed when they already had the entity administrator role. Um, so I, I would you could contact the FSD to find out, but you can actually see for yourself. So I would if you already have a sam.gov email address sign on, I would sign in like we showed today, go to your workspace and see if you can view the entity. Um, if you're not um, the entity administrator, there could be an existing administrator that has access to that. And our federal service desk can help you find out who that is if you can't find out internally. Um, because if there is an entity administrator, or actually you could just go to your profile and submit a request. Um, to, to grant the role and it would send them an email to, to get you access to it. Um, but an existing entity administrator um, should be able to see the entity in their workspace. They should also be able to go to their user directory, which appears below that entities box that we were showing um, with the bubbles and they'll be able to click add role, assign role um, and assign that to someone else, to you or someone else within the entity. Um, but if if the entity administrator does not exist um, and that doesn't work, then, then you would need to submit the letter, but only in that situation. Um, okay. Uh, my entity just received its 8A status and I was told to go through the system to update the entity so that SAM.gov connected to DSBS and the 8A status showed in SAM.gov. Let's see. So I think this speaks to, um, there. there is um, a disconnect, a technical disconnect in the system that's being corrected um, for I think the next release. Um, but basically there are some situations with, um, with SBA information that is not automatically passed through or showing up on your SAM registration. So there, so if you're having trouble with that, the best thing to do is contact the federal service desk um, and then we can send you the process um, to, to get that update corrected. Um, see if we have anything else. Yeah, I think I've gotten most of the other questions. Looks like it, you've been good. <laughs> I try. Okay. I'll mention again, Ivana, that we'll email out these slides today. Um, so you expect that email today. And I found out while you were presenting that we can share the recording as well. That will be done through a, a YouTube link on GSA's YouTube channel. That process does take a few days to set up and um, get published. So look out for two emails from us, one with the slides. Um, fairly soon and one with a link to the recording uh, in a few days or maybe even a week or so. Actually, there is one question that just came up I'd like to, to address. Um, it's from Donna and she's asking if, if they need to change the administrator's email address, is a ticket needed? I don't think you did this one yet, did you, Ivana? No, 
Okay. So my favorite answer in all of project management is it depends. Um, if the action, if you are today the entity administrator and you use an email address to access SAM and that email address is changing, we do have a process. It's kind of kludgy because it you have to bounce back and forth between SAM and login.gov to get things in alignment and then give yourself the role at the new address. But we do have a process for it. So I'd recommend reaching out to the federal service desk. If you're just adding in a new administrator, no ticket is needed. You can just assign that person the role once they've created their SAM.gov account. And I hope that was clearer than mud. And I think there's one more question if you want to take that, and then I think we're good to adjourn, Ivana. Okay, uh, so we have an active contract tied to a SAM record cage code for a branch office location that no longer exists. It's a contract and all the work is being performed at the government project site. We cannot let the SAM record expire until the project is closed out, but have no documentation to validate the entity since the office location no longer exists. What are our options? Um, so I, I assume that if the branch office location no longer exists, the company still exists. So I, I would recommend that if you haven't already, that you go through that process of updating. Um, I'm not sure if your registration is active or inactive at this point, but you would go through that process we showed of starting your renewal, where you would find the entity, click the three vertical dots, click update, you will get to a screen where um, you know, you'll say the information is not 100% correct um, that it has for you. And then you will be prompted to upload documentation. Um, give us what you have and de describe it in the details. Um, and then that way or any validation um, service and our team could work to figure out what other options we may have for you. Um, but if the entity itself no longer it exists or uh, you're going to merge to another um, UEI or cage code that you have, then sometimes the option is not to renew that one and to work with a contracting officer to modify the contract to use another UEI. It, it just, I guess, as Salome said, kinds of depends and we need to know more. Anything to add to that one, Salome? No, ma'am. I um, think you did a fantastic job, so thank you. And uh, I guess we're good to go ahead and adjourn for today. Uh, Alexis, did you have anything else for the good of the order? No. Um, thank you all very much for, for signing on and joining us today. And look out for those messages with the slides and the link to the recording soon.